Christ Community Church, located at 25th and Thomas Avenue in Portsmouth, Ohio. Well, thank you so much for uh, the great opportunity that you all have given me to be here. It's truly an honor and truly humbling to stand here before you. And uh, I just want to thank uh, my wife, Hagar, for being here, Hannah, um, Hagar's sister, for being here as well, and a special addition, um, Emmaus, our uh, three-and-a-half-month-old son, um, is here as well, um, sleep in Hannah's arms, so if you hear a loud screeching noise, you know that he's awake. <laughs> but I, I won't stop. My, I'm developing these, like, I guess these fatherly type of, uh, I don't know what the word is, but instincts. So I, I'll, keep, I'll keep speaking. I won't stop if uh, he happens to, to wake up. But thank you so much. Um, just one thing that I noticed um, in, in coming here and um, talking with Pastor Matt and uh, coming here is just, just the wonderful hospitality that, that you all have shown me and my family. And it is an amazing thing, truly. You know, I'm from Virginia, and I guess most people, people from the deep, Deep South probably wouldn't consider Virginia like the South, but we know a little bit about Southern hospitality, and I definitely, from being here these past couple of days, you guys know something about Southern hospitality, so uh, I really appreciate that. That means a lot to me, um, that you have shown me the love of God um, here, so give yourselves a hand. Um, I'll get right into it if you would turn with me to, if you have a phone or a copy of the scriptures, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. We'll look at Ephesians chapter 2 and we'll read verses 1 through 10. Could you guys turn that light down just like a hair, like just a little bit? That, I think that works. Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 10. Thank you for doing that, by the way. Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 10. And I know uh, yesterday evening they were able to put it up on the, uh, those nice big TV things right there. So if you have the capability of doing that again, that would be wonderful. And it says here in Ephesians 2, the Apostle Paul says the, these words. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him and seated us with him, in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Will you pray with me for a moment? Father, thank you so much that I can call you Father, 
and people here can call you Father and come to you in prayer. Thank you that you incline your ear to hear us. You stoop down to hear your lowly children. I praise you for that, God. You are, you are an awesome God, an amazing God, a gracious God, a merciful God. And Father, I come here to you this morning pleading with you for your mercy and for your grace toward us, on us here, that your spirit would help us, that you would open our hearts, open our eyes to hear and to see your work in the gospel and help me to communicate just how glorious and great you are and that you have taken me from such low depths of sin to great heights of glory in saving me and in calling me to yourself and giving me a, a platform, Father, to share with people what you have done in my life. Lord, I pray that you would humble me now and help me to speak your words. Give understanding to these people here this morning. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If I, if I were to title this, uh, this, this story that I'm about to share with you, this testimony of mine, I would call it From Death to Life. From death to life, and I think it really communicates my story in a nutshell to you. That I've been brought from death to life, but also in these great scriptures here in Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. It's about death from death to life in Christ. And so my testimony begins here in Ephesians 2, verse 1 where the Apostle Paul continues his letter to the believers at Ephesus, and he tells them, he says, he speaks to them in uh, their former manner of life. He says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins, or you were dead because of your trespasses and sins. I'm 29 years old, standing here before you today, but... From birth to around the age of 21 years old, I must confess that I too, at one point in my life, I was dead because of my trespasses and sins. And I grew up in a, in a Christian home, and maybe some of you here can relate to that. And my parents took me and my siblings to church every single week. Surely there was no debate about that in the Pyramid household, whether we'd be going to church or not. And some of you know about that. And I professed faith in Christ Jesus at the age of 10, and I got, I got baptized. Looking back on things now, you know what? I pretty much considered myself a, a pretty good person and that my faith in Jesus and me being a, a good person would get me to heaven. After all, you know what? People said that I was a good kid. I was successful at sports. You know, I got good grades in school. I was respectful to my elders, respectful to adults. You know, I stayed out of trouble. You know, I wasn't a thief or a murderer, or I didn't do anything really that bad, or at least I didn't think I did. And so from the outside looking in, you know, I sort of looked like a Christian believer. And even though I professed to be a Christian and I, I did Christian things, as I look back on my life, honestly, I just lived how I wanted to live during that time. You know, the Word of God didn't have authority in my life. I didn't understand the Word of God. And Ephesians Chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, describes the life I lived. And in these verses, there are at least three truths that describe my life and who I really was. And the first truth is that I was dead spiritually. Look back at verses 1 and 2a. It says, 
And you were dead because of the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Think about this. At one point in my life, I was a living dead person. Living physically, having blood running warm through my veins and having breath, living physically but dead spiritually. And what what does that mean? Well, it means that I was separated from God. Being dead spiritually, being dead is the life that's lived apart from God, apart from your creator. And in Ephesians 2.12, the Apostle Paul says to Christian believers, in reference to their former manner of life, he says this, you had no hope and was without God in the world. Is this not a dreadful state to be in, a dreadful condition? And this was my condition. This was me at one point in my life, separated from my creator God, at odds with God. Now, did I outright, did I ever say, I don't believe in God or I don't want to follow God? No, I never said anything like this. At this time in my life, I I thought that I was a Christian, and I wasn't even aware of these things. I thought I had a relationship with Jesus Christ. If I'm honest, I must say that for many years, I lived my life apart from God and apart from His Word. Now, I grew up going to church. I grew up going to Bible studies and vacation Bible school and all of those things. I, I listened to the preacher even. I was involved in youth group and Christian organizations. But the only thing my involvement in Christian things proved was that you can be a good person. You can have an outward appearance of Christian morality. You can be very nice to people. You can be successful in life and you can be successful in sports. You can be successful in your job and in your business. And you can have ease of life and be well-liked by other people. You can do and be all of these things and still be apart from God, apart from Christ. Isn't that an amazing thing? That you can do all of that and still be apart from Christ? And your life can go perfectly and still be apart from God and apart from Christ. And that was me living without God in the world. But how did I know such a thing? Now, how, how did I know that I was living without God in the world? How do I know that now? Well, The fruit of my life tells the story, and that leads to the second truth. And the second truth is this, that I lived in a lifestyle of sin, a habitual lifestyle of sin. Look at verse 3. It says this, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. And what does Paul mean here? Well, Paul here is talking about the corrupt and sinful nature of man apart from God, apart from Christ. The sinful nature that all people are born with, no matter what your economic status is, no matter what the color of your skin is, or the color of your eyes, or the color of your hair, or what you've done, all are born in sin. I come from Gladys, Virginia. You don't, you don't know anything about that. And I've lived a drastically different life than a lot of you. But we have more in common than you might realize. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I have that in common with you. 
And that common ground we share is more important than the differences we might share here today. I lost my spot here. Here, you know, don't miss this. Paul isn't talking about really, really, really bad people. You know, me and my wife, we like to watch Forensic Files. I know that might sound weird. You might not even know what that is. We like to watch Dateline ID about, you know, these different crimes that are committed. And these heinous people, they commit some of these different crimes. And it's, it's just crazy. She didn't want me to mention that to y'all. She's looking at me and shaking her head. They commit some of these heinous crimes that people look at and like, yeah, something is really wrong with those people. But here, Paul isn't talking about people on forensic files or dateline ID. He's talking about all people apart from God. And he's talking about me too. I lived in the passions of the flesh, meaning I lived a life under the power and under the dominion of sin, driven by its power and its control over me. And then it goes on to say, it says, carrying, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. What does he mean here? Well, I think it means an outward manifestation of what is truly in the heart. And how did my corrupt and sinful nature manifest itself? Well, in many ways. I want to mention several ways here. I lived in a lifestyle of sexual sin, which manifested itself in pornography and in a moral relationship. And as I think about these things here, having to share these things you know, that comes with a lot of shame admitting these things. And I think about different discussions that I've had with my wife before we got married and having to share with her these past experiences, my past sins. And it was so painful. And it led me to think that sin is a destructive thing. Sin destroys people. Think about, you know, people who unfortunately get addicted to drugs and you see the before and after picture and you see the before, the, the before picture, they're so full of life, they're in their youth. They have so much light in them, it seems. And then maybe only two or three years later, after being addicted to some drug, some powerful drug, only two to three years later or something like that, it looks as if they have aged 40 and 50 years. My dear friends, sin is a dangerous thing. Sin destroys people. And maybe you're here today. Maybe someone else's sin has in a sense affected you in such a way that you still bear scars here today from it. Or maybe you, some of the sins that you've committed... You bear scars from those sins. And you have deep regrets from those things. Sin, my dear friends, bears drastic consequences. Sin destroys people. Sin hurts people. And I might add that sin is first and foremost, even though I take myself, for example, even though I might sin against my wife or sin against a particular person, my sin first and foremost is always against God. My sinful nature manifested itself in, in me being self-righteous. Thinking that me being a good person and my faith in Christ Jesus would get me to heaven. My dear friends, that's pride. Thinking that I could stand before an infinitely holy and righteous God and be accounted as right before him because of my own perceived goodness. What pride is there in that? My corrupt nature showed itself in that I lived a, a self-centered lifestyle. A lifestyle in which I came first and everyone else, including God, came next. 
And in all these ways and so much more did I live with an unwilling heart to turn away from my sin. That leads, that sort of leads to the third truth. And that is this, I was under the wrath of God. Now I know that that doesn't sound very nice here today, but it's in verse 3, it's, it's in these holy scriptures that God has given. We see what God's response is to the one who lives out Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. His righteous anger is against them. It says, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. I was really under God's wrath because of my sin, because of my disobedience towards God. But was I a seemingly good person deserving of this? Well, rightfully so I was deserving of this. Because sin is an offense to God's holy and righteous character. Sin is an affront to God. And my dear friends, this was, this was my sad condition. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. Spiritually dead, without God in the world. Living in sin and under its dominion and under the wrath of God. And might I add, being under the wrath of God doesn't mean that in this present life or during that time in my life that somehow really bad things were happening in my life. No, I had, had ease of life. I had success somewhat in life. And so under the wrath of God doesn't mean that there's fire and brimstone raining down on your life. But under the wrath of God means that I was apart from God, an enemy of God. But surely there was something I could do about this, right? Surely I could pull my own self up by my own bootstraps to get on good terms with this God. But I ask you, can a dead person do anything but be dead? I was in this helpless state. Yet during this time in my life, I truly and honestly believed that I was a Christian. I would have emphatically declared to any one of you that I was a believer in Jesus Christ. And I believed that somehow, despite how I lived and the things I enjoyed, that I was still a Christian. In a sense, I believed that I could sort of live how I wanted to please, how, how I pleased, live how I wanted. And still receive forgiveness, still be a Christian. And this isn't, I know that Christians struggle with sin and battle with sin, but with me, this wasn't the case. I loved my sin, I had no problems with it. I thought I was a Christian, but as the scripture says in Proverbs, there is a way that seems right to man. I thought I was a Christian, I thought I was going in the right direction. It's a way that seems right, but in the end it leads to destruction. And so back to sort of my story. In 2004, I graduated from high school and went to college at the University of Virginia on, on a full scholarship to play football. And even in all those things, even in that, even in going off to college, you know, you have freedom. You can do whatever you want to do. Maybe there's some people here in college or who are about to go to college. You know, I still uh, attended church, and I went to campus Bible studies and football Bible studies that we had. But as a person in college who didn't understand what it meant to be a Christian, there came more and more opportunity, opportunities for disobedience and sin to God. And I would warn you here today, if, if you are a graduating high school student heading off to college, be very careful. You're going to be out on your own, living 
on your own for the first time in your life. Your parents aren't going to be there. Some parents are probably thinking, I am not sending my kid off to college. (laughs) But be forewarned here today that college life, college culture, even on Christian universities can be a very dangerous thing, depending on the people you hang around with and the people you and the things you get involved with. So as an unbeliever in college, there came more and more opportunities to stray away even further from God. However, a failed relationship, a failing football career, and the struggle for identity on a college campus where there was so much, so many different ideas and things that people were doing. With this struggle that I had for identity, it got me thinking about where my life was heading. And in 2006, after a completely a disastrous football season for myself. I was determined that the next year would go better because I had all of these dreams about going to the NFL and breaking a record, breaking records and doing all of these different types of things in college. And so I made every effort to focus on football, focus on training so I could be a starting running back in the 2007 season. And you know what? All my hard work paid off. Seemingly for a time it paid off. I was leading the the conference, the ACC, in rushing. I had all of this notoriety, highlights on ESPN and people talking about me. Until the sixth game of the season. I'll never forget it. Dislocating my foot and missing the remainder of the season. And this was a huge blow to me because football was basically everything to me. You know, in a sense... It was why I got into college. I would have never gotten into the University of Virginia on just my grades alone. But as I look back on things now, football, you know what, was just this huge idol in my life. You know, it was, it was something that made me look like I was somebody. It gave me purpose. It gave me pleasure. I loved it. I enjoyed doing it. It gave me notoriety and all of these things. It made me look like I was somebody important. But later that year, in December of 2007, I'll never forget it. A friend gave me a sermon. It was out of the practice. He gave me his iPod to listen to. And he put it on this sermon about what it meant to be a Christian. And I listened to it. And for that first time ever in my life, upon hearing this man's words, I realized that day, at that time, at that moment, that there was a good chance that I wasn't a Christian. And that means so many things. It means that I didn't have forgiveness of my sins. It means that I didn't know Christ as my Savior, that I didn't have eternal life. Upon hearing this man's words, I felt that my sin uh, was completely exposed before God. I knew that God knows everything, but for the first time in my life, I felt like the doors had been swung wide open and every person could see who I truly was. I was a hypocrite. But ever since that day, my life really hasn't been the same. And when I read the second part of our our text in Ephesians 2, 4 through 10, I understand and I, I know, I see what happened in my life. And so from Ephesians 2, 4 through 10, I want to talk about four truths really quick that are reality now in my life. And hopefully they are a reality in your life. Listen here, the first thing is that God had mercy on me. Where am I getting that from? Well, look in verse 4, it says, here it says, Paul says, simply, but God. And to me, here in Ephesians 2, 4 is found one of the most dramatic turn of events ever recorded in all of history. 
I say that because there is an infinitely deep and wide abyss that separates Ephesians 3, 2, 3 from Ephesians 2, 4. That only God himself can navigate. On one side you have me and my, my sinful and dark and helpless state. And on the other side there is this God who was merciful. And I need this mercy from him. I'm under his wrath. I need him to be merciful to me. I don't need him to give me what I truly deserve. And on top of that, not only was I in desperate, desperate need of God's mercy, God was not under obligation to show me mercy. But he did. He had mercy on me. I think about this. How can I illustrate to you the magnitude of this but God? Well, here's maybe a, a weak example. Hopefully it will help, but think about the word but. Like it can make all the difference when hearing some news about a loved one or about a friend. Think about this. Like maybe you've heard your husband was in a really, really bad car accident, and the driver of the other car was killed. But your husband, he didn't sustain any injuries. What, uh, what joy would you have? You've heard this terrible news and then you hear this, but you're waiting for something else. And you hear this amazing news. Oh, thank God, my husband is okay. Or, or maybe this, for, for example. The doctor comes back in and says, I'm sorry to have to tell you this. You have cancer, but it's treatable. Oh, what joy, what hope that that would bring to you. Do you see here in Ephesians 2, 4, the magnitude of this, but God. It says here that God is rich in mercy. And the only way I can know that he is rich in mercy is if I'm aware. The only way I can know that is if I'm aware of my corruption, of my corrupt, sinful nature that is depicted in Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. I can never appreciate the glory, the magnitude, the greatness, the awesomeness of Ephesians 2, 4 through 10 without seeing the ugliness and the darkness of Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. My dear friends, how can a man ever know that he is in need of a Savior if he doesn't recognize that he is sinful and under the wrath of God? How can he ever know that he's in need of someone to rescue him? This mercy, this mercy is given was given to me, one who didn't deserve mercy, nor was capable of doing anything to receive that mercy. God is rich in mercy. He gave mercy to me, one of his enemies. And this is why I believe that God's mercy is, is so astounding. He doesn't, me in my dead state, he just doesn't say to me, first you need to do X, Y, Z. First you need to start doing this or get rid of this. No, while I was dead, he had mercy on me. When I was in my sin, he had mercy on me. And the second thing, the second thing is that God made me alive. Verse 5 says, Even when we were dead in our trespasses, He made us alive together with Christ. And this, this is astounding to me. While I was not looking for God, 
while I was living my life as I pleased, while I was headed for eternal separation from God, God resurrected my dead soul to newness of life. In 2 Corinthians 5.17 it says, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. The old has passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And this is the re new reality for me. No longer dead, but a new creation. Born again, a new person. A different person. And as a result, of God's mercy as a result of this newness of life imparted to me by the Holy Spirit. The sin I once loved, I began to hate and began to struggle and battle against. I began to fellowship with other believers, something I really didn't want to have any part with before. And I began to have a love for God's people. I began to understand God's word and the glorious gospel the good news of Jesus Christ. I begin to understand how my sin, it was my sin was an offense to God and that because of my sin, I was separated from God and deserving of his wrath and of his eternal judgment. But this God acted on my behalf and sent his son into the world and his son became a man. It was this Jesus that I've been talking about, this Jesus, God made man, who humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross, the creator of the universe became a man. The one who doesn't slumber or sleep. In the boat there on the lake, we see that he was sleepy. We see that he was hungry. The one who created bread and created food chose to partake of these things and chose to live as a man for you and I. Humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. And on that cross, for three hours, he was under God's wrath because he bore sins on that cross at Calvary and shed his blood as a perfect payment for sin. It's finished is paid for in full. It's Christ who has done it all. Not my goodness. Not my works. But it is Christ. I love the song that says, It was Jesus who paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain and he washed it white as snow. And the third thing, we're coming down to the end here. The third thing is that God saved me by his grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Where am I getting that one from? Well, look at verse 5b. At the end of verse 5, it says, by grace you have been saved. Verse 8 says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Verse 9 says, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. My dear friends, no longer do I, I trust in my own perceived goodness. My salvation rests in God alone, in Christ alone. If Christ can't save me, then there's no one else who can. And the fourth thing is that God saved me. He did this marvelous work in my life for his own glory. Where am I getting that one from, you say? Well, verse 7 says, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace toward us, of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. I know we often hear songs and sermons and I've even mentioned it, that when Christ was on the cross, he was there for you. And when he bled, he bled for you. And he saved you. And he did it for you. And all of that is true. But I would submit to you here today that when God saves people, when Christ was on that cross, he was doing it for the glory of his Father in heaven. 
He does it so that throughout time and eternity all might marvel at him in saving sinners. And this is not a bad thing. You know, if I do something for me, if I live life and it's all about me, that is a very bad thing. But when God does it, it's not a bad thing because he's worthy of glory. He's the creator of the universe, of the world and, and everything in it. And he's worthy of it. And so I hope from my testimony, from my story, that you can see the greatness of God in redeeming sinners. Look at my story if you don't believe that here today. Infinite, great depth of sin was I in. I was dead, a helpless state. In a sense, this is the greatest story of rags to riches. Being dead and then being resurrected to newness of life, the same power that raised Christ Jesus has raised me to newness of life. But my dear friends, I don't mean to make my testimony here. It's not all peaches, you know, and roses and peaches. This Christian journey that I've been on for several years now has not come with ease of life. It hasn't been without difficulty. But what is the thing, or what is it that is keeping me? I think about Ephesians 2.10, I am, I am his workmanship. He's working on me. He hasn't left me. Even though the man in the mirror isn't always pretty and pristine, and even more so since I've been a Christian and even married, I see more of my faults, more of my sins than ever before, but praise God for that. Because when I see those things, I am all the more eager to run to Christ. I see my desperate need for Him. And I see... God working in it all in my life to make me more like Christ. Who else is there to be made like than to be made like Christ? My dear friends, I do not lead with being an NFL football player. As I told um, the good people last night, but I just happen to be a Christian who plays football for the Cincinnati Bengals. And so if you tune into a game, or perhaps you make the two hour drive to Paul Brown Stadium, and you see a little number 30 running out on the field right then and there, I don't want you to think that there's a, a really good football player. What I want you to see from now on is that I am a man who is desperately dependent upon Jesus Christ. And it is by his grace that I'm able to run around on that field out there and do all of those different things. But here today, what is your testimony here this morning? Is it the whole of Ephesians 2? Is it 1 through 10? Have you been brought from death to newness of life? Can you honestly read Ephesians 2.1? Can you say, I was dead? Maybe here today, 
you say, you know for certain, I don't know of this Ephesians 2, 4 through 10. I just came here because I just wanted to meet an NFL football player. My dear friend, don't you realize here today that you only have Ephesians 2, 1 through 3? And I'm not trying to be hard or mean or anything like that but this is the truth of the matter i care for your soul my dear friend you are you are helpless and in need of the mercy of god and i bid you i i i beg you to pray to him and plead to him for this mercy that you so desperately need i encourage you to look to christ who saves to the uttermost who delights to save sinners, who would come to him. My dear friend, you, you are not too far gone. You are not out of his reach. He is the God of the universe. He can do as he pleases. No, my dear friend, look to the cross where Jesus laid down his life for sinners. Why will you continue under God's wrath and living apart from God? Don't you see Christ's love for sinners? Don't you see that here today? Look, he, he lived for them. He fulfilled the law that they couldn't fulfill. He did it for them. He endured the cross for them. He took their guilt for them. He bore their sins for them. He took God's wrath for them. He died for them and he rose for them. Don't you see that Christ is worthy? He's worthy of you laying down your life to him. Has anyone died for you lately? My dear friends, if you see your helpless state of Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, 1 through 3 then trust in Christ. Believe on Christ. And turn away from your ways to God's ways. And my dear friend, you, you shall be saved. And continue to trust and continue to believe all the days of your life. And if you profess to be a Christian here today, then I say to you, then what are you trusting in for your salvation? What are you trusting in, believing in, hoping in for your right standing before God? Is it that you were baptized in this church or some other church? Are you placing your hope in that you're a good person and you go to church on a regular basis? Are you trusting in that your parents, they're devout Christians, and so that sort of makes you a Christian as well? Or maybe you're trusting in your own perceived goodness, just as I was at once. My dear friend, if, if you're not trusting in Christ alone, then you are standing not on a solid foundation, but you are standing on rocky soil. You are standing on uneven ground. And you are believing in a different gospel that cannot save, that won't save. And maybe if you're here and you are trusting in Christ alone and standing on his promises, then let Ephesians 2, 1 through 10 lead you to great joy and adoration of your Savior, Jesus Christ. Look what he has done for you on your behalf. He has changed your eternal destiny. Look at the depths of the mercy that he has had on you. Look at what he has delivered you from, what he has brought you out of. He saved you from, the, from God's wrath. He saved you from your sins. So let that well up in you a spirit, a, a heart of praise toward this great God that you serve. Even though in your life things may look like they're unraveling apart at the seams. Maybe sickness, maybe death, maybe financial insecurities, maybe a struggle with a certain sin. 
My dear friends, look at the cross. Look at Christ. And find hope and joy in him and not in your circumstances. Be grateful that you can read Ephesians 2, 1 through 3 as a former manner of life and can embrace the new life of Ephesians 2, 4 through 10, that great and glorious passage. Amen. Amen. Pastor Matt, thank you. Christ Community meets on Saturday at 5 p.m. and Sunday at 10.30 a.m. For more information, visit www.christcommunity.net or check out our Facebook page.